Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. I'm Jennifer Richmond, and today we're in Ephesians Lesson 4, Day 6, and we are circling back through Ephesians Chapter 4, kind of the end of that, and digging back into that, and opening it up and exposing more of the truths that are in there. So I'm really glad that you're with us. Let's go ahead and pray and get started. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for our time together today. Thank you for all of those listening, their love of you and their love of the word. And we ask that you would bless our time together, that we would have wisdom and understanding, that the word would come alive to us in new ways, Lord, that we would see uh, who we really are because we see you. Uh, help us to respond in a obedient and loving way to your word today and bless us in our time again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and dig in. I'm gonna switch screens over here to our lesson. Again, this is lesson four, we're on day six, and we're gonna be going back through um, some of the passages we've talked about before, and we're just gonna dig a little deeper and then move on um, toward the end of chapter four again today. So let's go ahead over and do our reading, which is gonna be Ephesians 4, uh, 25 through 32. And we're gonna do that from the New American Standard today slide that, get that screen a little bit bigger so you can see it better. All right. I'm going to go ahead and read that with you. And then we'll go back through and we'll do our memory verse together. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Let's go ahead and read. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak the truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. I love that idea that you have words that can be perfect in the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Powerful word there. Let's go ahead and review our memory verse, Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. I'll scroll down so you can see that. Be imitators, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Years ago, I memorized this from the New International Version, which is probably why every now and then when I say it, I kind of trip up on my words. Um, but I wrote a little melody uh, to help me remember it. It goes like this. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us. See? So much easier when you put a song to melody, right? I know I shared that a couple of Bible studies ago, but sometimes we get new people joining in and they didn't hear the Bible study from a while ago. So I thought I'd sing it for you again. Just really easy melody like this. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us. Isn't that easy? Thankful for my parents. My mom and my dad both loved scripture and taught it to us from the time we were really little. And my dad in particular would take verses from the Bible and write melodies to them and help us memorize them. We'd sing them in church and youth group and at home. So I have a lot of those songs in my mind. And then as I grew up, I started doing the same thing. And so that's a song that God gave me years ago, many years ago, actually. Um, and uh, to help me memorize that, that particular verse in scripture. All right, let's go ahead over to our lesson. Today's a little longer than normal. I wrote a note there to let you know that. I don't know, some of you might do the lesson and think that doesn't seem too long, but I don't know. I think there's a lot of scriptures to look up and I always try to give you kind of a heads up if I think it's gonna go a little long. So we'll see how it goes, right? All right, so let's review Ephesians 4, 15. How does it set up the specifics of uh, 25 through 29? Well, Ephesians 4, 15, I'm gonna go ahead and read that here. Where is that? Ephesians 4, 15. And rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So he's setting us up, speak the truth in love, and he keeps on moving on. And then the specifics that he says are in 4, 25 through 29. And there he says, um, put away falsehood, speak the truth with his neighbor, 
you know, we are members of one another, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger and all that. So he's going through all of the very specifics about speaking the truth in love, what to do and what, what not to do. Be like Christ, he's saying. Don't, um, don't, don't act out in anger. Don't, don't speak out falsehood. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. So there's 10 words in verse 26b, that first part there. That's in the ESV translation. So I thought we could take a minute to come up with an acrostic to help us memorize that verse by creating a tip for each word to help you fulfill this in your walk today. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. 10 words, right? So for each word, we're going to come up with some kind of a tip to help us to remember it. Maybe it's an easy verse for you to remember anyway, but this will help you to bring it out and really think about what that means. Here's what I came up with. Uh, D for do. So I thought of the word die for die to self and do it now. Make it right. So D for do. Um, not. I wrote not for me, for God. Not for me, for God. Um, L for um, let is love. Um, the. I, I got the TH from the, and I thought, think about tomorrow. And a good advice is, you're going to apologize at some point. How much are you going to apologize for? You're going to be communicating with that person at some point that you're angry and be with. How much are you going to have to, how much are you going to have to take care of business with? You know, the keep short accounts, it says, love keeps no record of wrong. So think about tomorrow and move with that mindset. So Next word is sun. And I thought of the word sun also, S-O-N, sun. He's my example. And go. The next word is go. So do not let the sun go. And so go, I wrote, go and do his will. Down is the next word. Down, that's where my head is before God. It's down. You know, rather than up and prideful, it's down and humble. On. On my mind is God's word, is what I wrote that God's word is on my mind. I'm thinking about the situation that I might be angry about, but my mind is on God's word. Your, well, it says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. I thought of my heart, your heart and the heart of God, God's heart. And then finally, anger. I just wrote that anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires. And that's from a verse from uh, James chapter one, verse 20, that I also memorized years ago that the righteous life, anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And it's not that we're not to be angry, it's that that kind of living in anger isn't, doesn't help us to live out that righteous life. So I'd like to hear yours. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. What words helped you in that to focus in on what that all means? So Paul moves from addressing anger to addressing kleptomania, really. In Greek, steals is from the root klepto, which is where we get our word kleptomania. Note the tense of the verb, present tense. In other words, people were stealing. <laughs> Based on what Paul has taught in Ephesians 4, 19 through 24, what observations would you have about the person in the church who is still stealing? And let's go ahead and consider also um, Thessalonians 3, 10. I'm gonna call that up right here. I my big screen there. and Hop over to that so you can see that. It always gets smaller. But in Thess 2 Thessalonians 3.10, it says, For even while we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. If you're not willing to work, you just steal to get what you want. Paul says, you don't get to eat. <laughs> you know, when America was founded, and I uh, was uh, Captain, oh, what was his name? Was it Rogers? <laughs> I'm thinking Captain Morgan. That's not it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to look that up. Anyway, in the founding of America, they came over and they settled in the, what is now the Virginia colony. And uh, they had that same word um, for their people as well. If you're not going to work, you're not going to eat. And that was a tough winter for them to survive when they first came over and landed here in America in the 1600s. And the exact same biblical principle that we're learning here today was taught to those people back in the day. It's a really interesting story back then about how um, some of the people didn't want to work. They maybe came over and they were higher up and aristocrats and they were used to people working for them. And the man, and I'm, gosh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I, I taught American history for nine years and I can't think of his name. I'll look it up. I'll, I'll message in with it later. Maybe some of you can Google it and tell me. Anyway, when they founded this colony, 
uh, he made that edict. You're not going to work. You're not going to eat. And that's a biblical principle. I always laugh when people say America wasn't built on biblical principles. Yeah, it was. Totally was. <laughs> anyway, back to our question. Um, so based on what Paul has taught in Ephesians 4, 19 through 24, what observations would you have about the person in the church who is still, who is still stealing? Um, they're greedy. They have not. What was that sound? That was an odd sound. I have to go check that out. Hold on just a quick second. Stop the share and I can pause this. It's, so, it's odd because I'll just pick up right where I left off, but I'm going to go check this out. Hold on, hit <laughs> that button first. Okay, I, uh, I've got a lot of, I've got bacon, a lot of bacon cooking in the kitchen right now. So I heard a, some kind of an odd sound and I thought maybe it was, I don't know, the bacon cracking in the oven. I just wanna make sure it wasn't anything crazy. <laughs> you should smell my house right now. So I've got like 16 pounds of bacon that I'm rotating through the oven throughout this morning. So anyway, <laughs> everything's fine. Back to our study. Let's go ahead and get that screen back up there for you again. Um, so Paul has taught this in Ephesians 4, and so um, what, what, what do you have? What, well, they're not practicing what Paul has been preaching. And remember, he's been saying, I assume that you know about the truth from Christ. I assume that you've been taught well. And if they're stealing still, they, they don't know. They haven't been. They're not putting into practice the things that he says. He says they are greedy. They have not put off um, or been renewed. They have not put away the old self. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, it says in Thessalonians, um, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So these, this is teaching that he's been giving and they're not putting it into practice and they're serious warning there for us as well, put into practice the things that you have been taught about Christ. Considering the audience of his letter, saints in Ephesus, what does the existence of this sin sim, um, uh, apply imply about what happens to a person after they become a Christian. Well, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you are perfected. We've talked a lot about this. Um, you're saved. You are sanctified in the moment of salvation. Um, but there's a lot of work to do. There's old habits to break. And people are uh, prone to wander, as the song says, right? People are prone to go back to their old ways, to grab off those old clothes, take off the new that you've been given. And we have a new spirit inside of us. But Paul's saying, you're acting like you don't. You, you do, uh, but you're acting like you don't. You need to take off the old and put on the new and get involved in your sanctification. Let's take a look at Ephesians 4.29 and read that alongside of um, Psalm 25, 11 through 12. How could you put it, this into practice in your life today? Let's let the screen refresh and get that up there. Ephesians 4.29 again says, let no corrupting word talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And let's take a look at Psalm 25, 11 through 12. It says, this is that, this was the verse I was thinking about a couple of days ago in the study. I couldn't quite quote it correctly, but it, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. In other words, it's something that's perfectly made for the occasion. It looks perfect. It's amazing. Um, and it, it, it makes everything else around it better. And that's a good word. That is a word that is fitly spoken. And so how could you put this into your practice today? Well, once again, we are, you know, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to put off the old self. We need to put on the new. The Spirit is indwelling in us. That's not going to go away. We're sealed for the day of redemption. So that's there. Um, <clears throat> but we need to be putting into, we need to be putting into practice those things. Ah, hold on. Big old sneeze working its way up. <laughs> I just assume get a, get a good satisfying sneeze going. Um, anyway, in terms of me personally putting that into practice today, I think about the things that trigger me in terms of my mouth and what I, like the ruts that I tend to get into and how I respond to people. And I find myself in a situation where I'm not responding well. I either don't have anything to say that's worthwhile or I have things to say and they're not worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's one or the other. Um, and so my continual prayer is that God would help me with my mouth, give me good discernment, and that I'm, well, like I've said before, I'm all prayed up. Like I, I am in that spirit. I put on the new clothes. I put on the new self. And I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to work through me, not just in me, but in and out and through me. 
So every religion has a moral code, which can be st distilled down to do well for the sake of yourself, humanity, and your eternal destiny or afterlife. It's just my way of kind of putting it all, wrapping it all up. This is what moral codes are and religious moral codes, I think, distill down to. While this is true to some degree, even in Christianity, something is missing in other religions. What do you see as the Christian distinctive? What verses from Ephesians can you use to support your answer? So for me, I think that getting it right isn't the end, in the end, isn't a matter of keeping a list of to do's or to don'ts. <laughs> it's about responding to the gospel with a, with a yes, right? Submitting yourself to Christ, letting the Holy Spirit empower, like I was saying, empower you from the inside out. There is a sense in other religions that they have the list of do's and don'ts, what you to do and what you're not to do. And those are all good things. I mean, any Christian would, for the most part, would agree with any of that. But what's lacking? The empowering of the Holy Spirit. That's what's lacking. What, what, is mo what if most religions, especially Eastern New Age religions, have added is you can become God. You are part of the, the God in nature, in a sense. And what we say as Christians is you don't become God, you become God-like, you become godly, which is what we're going to see here in chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God. Don't become God, be imitators of God. Whereas Eastern religions say, do keep the do's and, keep the, and avoid the don'ts, and you will become God. That's an old, old, old lie, as old as the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Right? Oh, you know, God doesn't want you to have all that because he knows you will become like him, right? And uh, Satan short circuits the whole process. They fall for it. And well, that brings us to this, this point in our life today. So verses that would support that, I would say um, throughout uh, our, our verses in Ephesians, all the way back to our memory verse from verse chapter one, um, that he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In other words, in Christ, we have the spiritual blessings. Um, chapter 2, verse 10, that we are his workmanship, that we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works that are were created in advance for us to do. Um, chapter 3, um, verse 10, that um, when, we live this, when we live this out, that the uh, wisdom of God would be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's our audience. And then continuing on, five, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, our memory verse for this week, that we're to be imitators of God. As dearly loved children, walk in love as Christ loved us. We have, we're all modeling after Christ in all of this, right? And that it's not a matter of trying our best to do good and trying our best to avoid wrong, but we've been given a new heart, right? And we then put off the old and put on the new is our daily act. But the act that's been done inside of us is by giving us a new heart and giving us the Holy Spirit. See the combination there? All right. What distinctive about the Holy Spirit in Christianity does the fact that the Holy Spirit could be grieved over our sin imply? Add your observations about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit to your doctrines chart. Well, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. The fact that the Holy Spirit can be grieved means the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit isn't a power, an energy force, and a lot of heresy um, around Christianity would describe the Holy Spirit as a, a, as a force, the force of God, the energy aspect of God. Whereas the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person himself, right? And so, because we can grieve the Holy Spirit, you can't grieve a force of nature um, any more than you can make lightning sad or make the ocean waves cry, right? We don't grieve nature, we grieve God himself, and the Holy Spirit is God. Um, so add those to your doctrines chart, make sure you understand the difference there and, and be aware of heresies that come out. Um, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the Trinity, they don't they, that the Holy Spirit isn't a separate, you know, they don't see the Holy Spirit as God. They don't believe in the Trinity at all. They, the Holy Spirit is an energy force, and that's a heresy. We want to make sure we identify that, and we have scriptures like this on our fingertips and in our brains ready to go so we can identify that. So closely related yet greatly expanded is Ephesians 4.31 with 4.26. Why do you think Paul heads the list in 4.31 with bitterness. So in 431, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away with you along with malice. But he heads the list with bitterness. In 426, he says, be angry and do not sin. And then he expands all that 
in 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, including malice. Why? Well, here's my thought on that. Bitterness can lead to all of those things. When we're angry and we sin, we can move to, you know, lots of problems, but bitterness is one of them. If we're angry and we don't express it by speaking the truth in love, what's the natural outcome of that? Well, we're bitter and we're looking for ways that that person is doing it again. Oh man, I hate it when I do that at myself. I get angry, I don't express it, I hold on to it, I get bitter, and then I look for ways they're doing it again, right? That starts with bitterness. And then Paul opens it up. Wrath, anger, clamor, stirring up trouble, slander. Clamor is stirring up trouble where everyone can see it. Slander is stirring up trouble behind the scenes, right? And malice of forethought. That's like evil intent. And, um, you know, that's, that's Paul's concern there. Don't let it be like that. All right, continuing on here. Let me go back to our big screen. You can see that. All right. So God takes bitterness very seriously. And um, I'd like us to read Hebrews 12 along with Deuteronomy 26. Um, this illustrates bitterness in these two passages. But I'd also like you to take a minute to draw a picture of that as the root, um, with bitterness as the root and all the sins that follow it. You know, it's, I want us to get that visual of what happens in our heart when we allow that bitter root to grow. But let's take a look at what the Word of God says here in Hebrews. He says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Now he's kind of giving a nod back to this situation that happened in um, the Old Testament under the leadership of Moses. He says in verse uh, 18 of chapter 29 of Deuteronomy, he says, Beware, lest there be any among you, man or woman, or clan or tribe, whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of other nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root-bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. That root of bitterness, this is a turning away from God and going off to the gods of other lands. Now, a lot of us would read this and say, I'm not going to go worship another god. But we do. You might not be bowing down to some golden idol, right? But what do we do? We worship at the feet of our own idol of ourself. I want you to picture yourself like the like you know uh, Oscar award, right? That the golden Oscar, and that's you, and you're standing there like this. You're bowing down to your own idol of self when you allow bitterness to grow. Why? Because you're putting yourself first, not God and God's will. And uh, I, I shouldn't be saying you are putting yourself. I put myself first. This is exactly me. I, I want to picture myself like this. I'm going to draw this root here of bitterness and springing out of this, these ugly words on this dead looking plant, bitterness, wrath, bitterness is the root, wrath growing out of that anger, clamor, slander, malice, just dead and ugly uh, that this plant, this will be such a good contrast to the hopefully the good plan that you drew um, in our lesson last week. So how does Paul show God as the ultimate example in Ephesians 4, 32? Well, he says he's kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, as God and Christ forgive you. These, this is what God has exemplified for us. I mean, we know it's God's kindness that has led us to repentance. That is his tenderheartedness that forgives us and welcomes us in um, and that he has forgiven us, right? So this is God as our, always as our example. So I don't know, it wasn't too long, was it? I think when I was typing it up, I might've had a few more verses I wanted you to look up and I might've deleted them out at the end. That's why it didn't end up being as long. It didn't seem too long. Did it seem long to you? No, okay. Well, let me go ahead and close with this thought. I heard it said long ago that parking yourself in a garage doesn't make you a car any more than sitting in a pew of a church makes you a Christian. As much as completing a list of good and avoiding a list of bad behaviors might make you a nicer person, it won't make you a more saved, sanctified, or heavenly bound person. Life in Christ is about walking our new walk, giving special consideration to sins that interfere with the unity of the body and obeying God. But that's not the way to the new life. That's the result of the new life, a life that's been renewed because of what God caused to happen in you through Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. Anyone could be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. Only a Christian is able to live this way and make it matter for eternity. 
I hope that's an it. Hope that's an encouraging reminder for you, not only for yourself to know the difference between being good for goodness sake, like we do for Santa Claus, right? And being good for the sake of Christ, right? Being good because we have good in us now because of Christ. The Bible says that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. It amounts to nothing, right? So any good that we might pile up is just going through a sieve. It's not amounting to anything in the eyes of God. Um, being good and living the life of righteousness that Christ requires and modeled for us is because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're covered in the blood of Jesus. And now those, that righteousness can count for something because it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's got God's blessing on it. That's a huge difference. It's important I, that I want you to know that for your own personal walk, but I want you to know that as you engage with culture, as you engage with your friends or your family members who are getting it wrong on this and are wanting to be a good person. And surely that will matter for God in the end that your good deeds outweigh your bad or whatever heresy they might be falling into. And that you would have the tenderheartedness and the calmness and the, um, the accuracy in your words and be able to speak truth to them and say, that's, that's, not, how, that's not how it works. And uh, I've taught this before in Bible study, but just hear my heart on this. Just like there are physical laws that govern our physical universe, like gravity, for example, right? Pick up something. If I were to drop this right now, it would fall, make a big mess. That's gravity, okay? Just like there are physical laws that govern the physical universe, there are spiritual laws that govern the spiritual universe. And God's the author of both, right? So we obey the law of gravity. We really don't have a choice, right? We need to obey the spiritual laws as well, right? We need to, we need to respond to God in, in the spiritual laws. So use that as a way to help you not only in your own personal walk, but as you're communicating the love of God and the truth of his word to other people as well. All right. It's been great to be with you today in this study and uh, little interruptions aside. <laughs> I really wish you did have smell-o-vision as you're listening to this right now. Hey, why don't you tell me something that you're doing um, uh, either before or after your Bible study today? I'd love to hear from you. Be sure to say hi and drop a note into the comments there below. As always, remember that you are loved and prayed for, and I'll see you at our next study. Bye-bye for now.